patients who were trying to get apples and pears to talk to each other, but we seem to have succeeded. So it brings me great pleasure to welcome our Deputy Director General of Higher Education, who doesn't yet know who her minister is going to be, <laughs> perhaps later or tomorrow. <laughs> A very warm welcome uh, to the Seattle Bolero Conference. We hoped last year to welcome her as well, but unfortunately what happened on that event is the minister called her in and demanded that she had long um, uh, meetings with him on exactly the time we were, were due to be engaged. So it is with great pleasure, uh, pleasure that I introduce Dr. Marsha um, Sprinkwood. Uh, she has been a lot long, of long history in telecommunications, which is unusual for people in the higher education sector and really a little like a breath of fresh air. Um, so she served in that sector for over 20 years, including being a member of the SABC board. Uh, she has worked in the higher education sector in multiple senior roles, including as a vice principal. Uh, she is a strong proponent of good governance, data analytics, we'd be pleased to hear, future thinking and social justice. I can think of many ways in which the way in which she thinks we hope aligns with the way in which we think. So over to you, Marsha. And the numbers are self-evident, and 
this is a huge loss in investment in our education sector. So essentially, I uh, to do quickly um, explain, two thirds of the students are lost. It is, it is an indictment on the university system. Um, and so part of my hope since I started in the department two years ago is try to, to reverse this. And of course, it's a lot of work and we accept we can't do it on our own. That we are going to have to have extensive workshops to try and attend to this problem. Further context, um, postgraduates. Um, in 2020, there was a total of 151,268 postgraduate students in public universities, effectively 14% of the total student population in our public universities. This ratio has remained constant for over a 15 year period. This is a problem. Because we look at the NDP, we are supposed to generate at least 5,000 doctoral students per year. Uh, CHE, their study, which they, the report which they recently shared with Minister, I think it's December 2023, uh, CHE's Council of Higher Education, I, I promised I was never going to fall into the trap of using acronyms, but uh, yeah, I am. So, um, they said part of the problem is a lack of mentors. A uh, prevalence of the one-on-one -on -one postgraduate student supervision which our institutions are completely managed to, and which don't help the students in any way. And then uh, several others, but these are the most common ones that they identified in their report. So, what does the ecosystem look like for supporting our students? Um, tutoring programs, mentoring programs, academic development, supplementary instruction, first year experience programs. I'll quickly speak to the foundation around that towards the end. Uh, technology mediated learning, I heard about some of the comments made earlier. All lovely psychology support, um, rather psychosocial support, and others. Um, but remember when we go to the National Treasury uh, pleading for funds for our education system, all they see there are dollar signs. Who is going to fund this ecosystem? And the demands are simply increasing year on year. And I'll, just to illustrate, so you all know, the initial focus was tuition, and then it was tuition and accommodation. Then it was tuition, accommodation, and travel. Then it was tuition, accommodation, travel, and wraparound support. And, and so it escalates. I was trying to insert a slide, and for some reason, I was using HP, the previous computer, and I'm using Apple, and the slide simply came up into my presentation. But that slide was going to show you the acute graph. I mean, from a cost point of view, if I had to draw it, look at the shape of my hand, increasing costs education sector. And the variable that's missing is sustainability. So I'll quickly skip this. Um, you all know what UCDB is. Um, and, and I'll just quickly get given you a summary of what it's done and what it does. This is the profile of students that are supported. Um, we quickly decided to break it into ratios, 79% um, females, 73% males as beneficiaries, um, and here I want to say, and I say this because I, I have a son, one is extremely concerned about the decline in males in our university system. It is a huge, huge concern. And so when you look at support, 
support. Do you then say male students need more support than females? Because if the numbers come through from the trip, right through the university system, the only time the balance, almost the balance, is at doctoral level for some strange reason. And I think it's only because female students go off to marry or have children or babies or just other things. But that's the only reason. But at, at undergraduate and postgraduate level, it's a huge concern. And from a funding point of view, this misalignment is evident in the grants that we, that we allocate for UCD. Okay, I indicated earlier we support entrepreneurship and year on year, um, universities are increasingly um, incorporating this into their curriculum and we have annual competitions, which we fund. Um, I won't speak too much to this. And then we have uh, support uh, for the, uh, what I call another institution, and this is outside UCT, is, I don't know if any of heard of you, so we quickly find a survey, Academic Institute for Mathematical Sciences. Does anyone know of this is a show of hands? Okay. Alright, so we, we, whilst analyzing the profiles, the gender profiles, we've also looked at STEM inclination and how this looks like. Um, and when we looked at the data, we extremely worried. I haven't brought it here, but um, the decline in the uptake of STEM, and uh, it also follows gene patterns. Um, so Minister uh, Nzemande uh, decided to dedicate funds towards the STEM Institute, um, which essentially seeks to bring back interest into mathematics. We train teachers um, year and year, and um, of the 95 teachers that, uh, uh, or candidates that have been trained, 62% um, have moved on to become mathematics teachers. The aim of this is to ensure that we have annual, regular update, and someone spoke about it, pedagogy, um, in teaching mathematics and related sciences. Um, I must say, one is hugely uh, <coughs> excited and uh, supportive of what's happening at AIDS. Um, the, the ecosystem is, is perfectly uh, designed uh, for supporting development. So, students from across the country move to the Western Cape at different parts of the year, and they are Tutored in mathematics. Um, the accommodation is literally outside the, the venue where all of the teaching takes place. They are able to access the library 24-7, uh, access their lecturers almost 24-7. Um, and they are required to work put in um, no less than 14 hours a day um, in development. And um, AIMS brings in top professors across the world um, to come in and do this at a, on a charity basis. Uh, everything we pay for, at least AIMS pays for, is accommodation uh, and flights. Um, and this is happening annually, and um, I think the results are self evident. Um, it has been amazing that the, the greatest uptake has been from our rural institutions. And um, I decided to quote that uh, 34 out of 95 of those uh, that we are training come from that province. 17 from Khaute, I think 8 from Eastern Cape. I'm trying to remember the case in our hand account. So um, it's a start um, you know, to try and rebalance this without additional um, pressure on the person. 
Um, the foundation grant, I think you're all familiar with the foundation grant. Um, I'm not going to bore you with some of these texts, but in essence, what we've picked up here is that there is a decline um, across different institutions. Um, and I'd like to find out, uh, we've set up meetings with one-on-one -on -one meetings with all the vice chancellors to try and find out why is there a lack of support for the foundational grant. It's the only grant that we managed to uh, protect from budget cuts. The block grant, which supports operational grants, um, you know, paying salaries to universities and so forth, uh, was cut. The year grants were cut. I personally fought so hard with the National Treasury to avoid further cuts and we protected the foundational grant. This is the grant that is meant to reverse or address uh, student dropouts. But for some reason, the uptake from traditional universities is dropping year on year. And all the slide does is share some of the stats with you. Um, it is a concern. Um, we had uh, off the cuff discussions that we're told no. Um, <coughs> staff don't, don't have to do this as much focus on research. That's some of the anecdotal comments. But the whole point of the Foundation Grant is to help universities support the most needy students. Why would this grant, or the object of this grant, um, in some instances be classified as under expenditure? Um, I do have the, the table of all the universities that are understanding on this one, but I'm not going to embarrass you. I decided to be the brother, have a one on one plan for so we can have a better understanding of this. And of course, um, as um, perhaps in a mischievous way, I need to go to the higher education. Because we look at this policy aligned to implementation. And we picked up, there's a lovely clause. And the clause says universities must indicate student support. They must provide for it. So the first question we have is we are giving you a grant. What are you doing for student support on the basis of this grant? We are waiting for a very difficult conversation. So, the rate there is just basically what I've summarized. The decrease in the percentage of first-time entry students and foundation programs raises concerns about the future of the foundation program and whether there's appetite for from traditional universities. I highlighted it in red. It's the only sentence on the entire presentation that's in red. Because we fought so hard to retain this grant. Um, so the ecosystem, I thought if I were to really um, summarize it, we do have high health, I'm sure you are aware of high health. Again, as a matter of survey, quick survey, anyone who has not heard of high health, not heard. Excellent. Not heard. Okay. okay. All right. Um, that means the rest of you have, which is really good news for us. <laughs> because the investment in high health has been extensive. It, high health literally has um, uh, satellite offices across the country to support universities and students. Support the PSA sector, that is TVET, CETs, and universities. Um, with NSPAS increasingly uh, in our new loan system, um, okay, yes, we give NSPAS. This is the first, it was the 2024, was the first time. Yes, we looked at the numbers. The NSPAS 
just funding equal university funding. What does that mean? So we gave, uh, I think, and it's about 48 billion, and it was 54, or 49 billion. We anticipated the NSS demand increases, uh, NSS funding may exceed what we give universities in total. <laughs> but tied to it is because there's this additional demand that's coming on providing wraparound support for NSS students. But the cohort studies have shown that NSS students are performing better than non NSS students. That is an, it's an old cohort study, um, so I must give that as a footnote. But it is some indication. Um, and time to this is it because they know they have to work extra hard and, and that the policy has evolved to N plus one, moved from N plus two, it is now N plus one. Um, but um, those are old numbers. We hope to do a second cohort study to, uh, to establish if, if that hasn't been maintained post um, COVID. Because we do know COVID is an outlier in so many ways. Um, uh, so it's the wraparound. Then student support. Um, there's this provision in the legislation, and what we're going to try and do is to establish firstly universities are providing student support, and then can we do this in a uniform way so that student experience across the PC system is the same. Um, we do know the universities have argued in some instances that um, you know so that they offer you know, five star accommodation, and in others they offer two star accommodation. Um, and therefore, you know, student support cannot be the same. Uh, that's a discussion for another day, but um, I do want to ensure that student experience across the PCA system is the same. And what do we need to do uh, from a policy perspective to ensure that? So it's one of the projects that we are looking to do. Um, in the near future. Then security. We started having discussions with uh, securities of, of universities, again to ensure the uniform experience for students from across the sector. I must say, sitting in this position for two years on, uh, it has been every time I hear a student on or near campus, um, I feel completely deflated. It, it is disempowering in so many ways. And so we've had, started having discussions with security teams, uh, with uh, national intelligence, uh, trying to understand some of the challenges. Um, but yes, the first thing we picked up is a lack of uniform policies supporting student well-being. Um, and, I, and I say safety. And I told you earlier on, that part of us uh, uh, discoveries, you know, is around the gender imbalance. And so female vulnerability is acute. But it, it doesn't only stem, you know, from partner violence, because if you think of the last few years, recent years, those have been excuses <coughs> last years, particularly in the Eastern Cape, has been partner violence. Um, uh, Pretoria, so Kaute, gay partner violence, very high. But of course we do know there's also what I call the, um, and this is what we found in the gender-based violence report, which again we published recently, um, are lecturers. And the marks for money, or sex for money, sorry, sex for money, um, sex money, uh, is it sex money? Sex money. Sex money. Sex money. money. Sex money. Sex money. money. Sex money. money. Sex money.
you face different challenges. You may be doing okay because we're the main university, but then go to second year. The workload and the content is more advanced. Third year, say, fourth year. And the support should be right through, even after I graduate. I know that currently there is a call for staff members to be mentors for post-grad. But I'm still there on the other grade. Second year, they gave me some nice to thank you. Thank you. Bruce. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, Sotiko. I'm sure we have uh, discussed many issues there. Uh, the thing is, I, I am very fortunate. Uh, I was part of the family group. The person who came with the idea is Professor Lady Tuk, the son of Prof. Bencha. He was a professor at Cambridge, and we, we challenged him and said that you are this guy's for what can we do for something? And he suggested that we start games, but it was more of a postgraduate. Now, from what you say, it seems as it's working. But why don't we have one center? Why don't we have 10 names centers in South Africa? Because if you say it's 30 million, I'm sure we do need more. 300 million rents in that. So perhaps we need more of the aid. I'm aware that we have a center in Ghana and all the centers in Africa. But in this country, it affects the graduation of uh, engineers. At our university, many students who fail many of the engineering degrees. Uh, the basic foundation in mathematics is nature. So perhaps we need not one, <laughs> but 20 of the eight in South Africa. I know they are there in Africa, but in Africa. The second one is the foundation problem. Um, it's an add-on. There's an option for university to take on this. I, I have I have at University of North. In 1989, we started a foundation program, but supported by the European Union. It was so successful that the students ended up going, going into, did not go to BSc 1. The actual end went to medicine, architecture. So it was the failure of the program was a success. But it's an option for universities. It's not a, a you can't force them. When they look at enrollment targets, if there are students who are left and who, who probably will want to do foundation, that's where you take it. If you say, this is your target, 2% is foundation problem. So students who can't get admission at my university, they can be then be admitted into the foundation program. The, the extended curriculum program is working, but I also, also believe that the foundation program the, the, the issues around payment of time, which is going to increase uh, the ability of us to use the money. But thank you very much for your, for your uh, presentation. Okay, let's not switch your memory. <laughs> so, would you like to respond? Thanks, Tim.
proposal to use the university of market to site and then they want to go to the site. Why are you the to site? Then it's not your restriction. No, it's not our restriction. We support um, students wanting to study um, PhDs. Um, and I think a few years ago, that was as much as two billion that we have set aside for the students to travel abroad. Um, you know, we, we support mobility students in the process of, uh, no, it's, it's certainly multi-generational and uh, multi-level. Okay, then uh, my 10 and centers. Um, this is where I beg to differ. AIMS had just, having started 2018 or so, um, at least with um, teaching teachers on mathematics. Um, we need to have those teachers go back to their provinces and training and teaching other teachers. I think, you know, if you the dependency syndrome must come to an end. And I truly believe, for example, I mentioned the 34 uh, teachers uh, from Limpopo can on their own group and, um, and teach their fellow teachers. In other words, give what you've been given. Um, and uh, the promise that we, we've tried to secure from AIMS is that they will, we will ensure that we start having annual events um, to support teachers. But I can assure you that the, the teachers and lecturers in uh, Rwanda, for example, go back to Kenya. They, they, their intention is not to return and, you know, and create this dependency on South Africa, for example. So yes, they've established their own centre their center has established multiple satellite centers in Rwanda. And that's what we need to do so that we break this dependency. They're willing to offer their services online using, I listened to one student who was talking about YouTube, but using multiple technologies um, uh, you know, to, to enhance access and, and, and training. Um, and then the foundation program on it being an option. Yes, I think that's a, with great respect, it's a weak, weak excuse because if there's uptake and appetite um, and need for this, then universities can present an argument um, and, and we can see how we can support it. The aim, the, the fact is, this fund will be withdrawn and the consequences will be dire for those students who need it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Could we have some more comment on the foundation frame, uh, foundation programs? Other universities like to, um, to make a comment? We've got two um, people there. We certainly heard in this session yesterday, we heard of a student who didn't really know that he was enrolling for a extended program that was delighted because he passed <laughs> uh, Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I think uh, the, the grants uh, are indispensable in the context of the University of the Free State. The foundation grant has been one of the single biggest catalysts for institutional change um, in teaching and learning and student support coupled with uh, visionary um, uh, perspectives that were taken in the UCDP has helped uh, uh, to be uh, at least in our institution a very big catalyst uh, for change and uh, that's not a statement of passion it's a statement of empirical events in fact um, the fact is, uh, in terms of our students, uh, what we found is that the assumptions around the foundation grant was that this would be uh, support needs for extended program students only. Um, 
that is simply not accurate in 2024. Many of the supports that foundation students might have needed in the original conceptualization of the foundation grant, we found that the majority of our students now need those supports, whether they support the main or extended program students. I think, um, and I have a deep appreciation for the very difficult uh, situation you find yourself in DGG, but um, for equity, for the students that we've been able to successfully give access to public higher education, a reduction in these two grants would mean um, regressing even further in terms of through and success. We use it uh, articulated that too many students are lost. These grants are absolutely vital and should instead be used as catalysts for deep and innovative change. I so wish you could have uh, been here with us to listen to the students that work in these initiatives at Seattle Novella. They are deeply transformed and if you're looking for a next generation that will blow um, expectations out of the water, those students are a mass. So from my side, um, uh, if you need somebody to fight with you at Krishna, to uh, use a good fee stake to make a fur. I'll scrum with you. <laughs>
He said you should have students, you know, it depends on the university. They're on contract most of the stuff. And the minute they finish their PhDs, you can start teachers, they absorb them to the mainstream. So for me, that's a question of sustainability. And to what extent are we prepared to start incentivizing good teaching? For example, recently we've been talking about the National Teaching Awards. I mean, the amount that you give to the winner compared to what an anaerobic rated researcher gets, you, yeah, you love. <laughs> right? So for me, I feel like these are good programs. I am a product of that program. But we need to start thinking critically and really putting money, you know, where our mouth are and start incentivizing good teaching. <coughs> Thank you. There was one further comment there. Oh. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I think I'm proud to say that at Thai University, we are not returning money, so we are not part of inspections. However, I've been reading this guidance, and I think this is just an addition to the, uh, the comment on the policy that has not been. So I think the latest version that we have is since 2012, so that's about 12 years ago. Um, so I think we have to make a move in terms of updating that particular policy. And this also goes with the guidelines for the foundation programs as well. Um, I don't think we've had any um, updates. And I'm looking at one right now because we had some discussions with regards to how we have structured our foundation programs at our university. And one of the things that actually came out because our CFO was interested in terms of how we funded these programs and some of the changes that were being made. And the particular aspect that stood out for us was that we had actually indicated in a guideline that the funding policy has now moved away from three year budget cycles to set accounts for extended programs on a continuous basis. So when you make statements like um, you most likely will cut budgets. We usually use these guides to make decisions on how we operationalize our, pro our programs within universities. In some instances, we we'll are pointing on long term, and I think it speaks to the issue of stability as well. Where some of our colleges, because the structure of in my university is more on a college basis, some colleges are somewhat reluctant to appoint on the long term because they don't know when they can find out which then affects the stability and the operationalization of these programs. So my question is more, when these changes are happening, how, how long a period would we be notified so that we can then make the necessary adjustments because I don't think we exactly have extra deep pockets for us to be able to find the programs without the support of the department. Thank you. Thank you. 
say that we are central participants in protecting these grants. And understanding is not an option. Then the other one is um, review the policy. I absolutely agree. Um, uh, it is very archaic at the moment. Uh, and, I, and I do hope we can sit with the team. I think we sat with a group of uh, professors who were the, the architects for the uh, uh, foundation grant not so long ago. Uh, we spoke to enrollment uh, professors. Um, hopefully, we will move on with the review. Then the last one, um, incentivizing the teacher, that's music to my ears. Um, we, in fact, put it as a recommendation to minister and he supported it. Um, we have to perhaps um, uh, set up the funds for it um, to have an annual uh, teacher's excellence evening. Um, absolutely. Uh, and the same uh, uh, prominence as annual research uh, excellence evenings. I absolutely agree. Um, and perhaps we could invite um, criteria for that um, as we move towards that as an intervention definitely for 2025. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have kept you long past your bedtime. Um, but I would like to thank you all for your questions. I would also like to assure our DBG that we are extremely grateful, Monsieur Kumalera, for the UCDG. Because much of our work in the UC in Monsieur Kumalera would not be possible without it. Because we use Monsieur Kumalera funds, which are relatively small compared to the UCDG fund to leverage and act as a catalyst. And so we try to ensure that all of these support mechanisms that the UCDG can support, that we bring them together into a holistic and much more coherent approach of support to the students. So without the UCDG, Sierra Bulela would thrive less than it does, shall we say. <laughs> but thank you very much indeed for that. Um, it's also really good to know all the other things that we, we went beyond the UCDG to hear these other things and I think there's been some sparks that we can then ensure perhaps we can coordinate some things and, and just come to you and our collective wisdom and, and, and talk further to you. So thank you everybody for your participation. Thank you for coming to be with us and we look forward to your meeting.